Well, welcome everybody. I'm Julie Collier, Senior Director of Programs here at the Schwartz Center. As many of you know, we are a Boston-based nonprofit organization established in 1995 to advance compassion in healthcare. Our vision at the Schwartz Center is that everyone who provides and receives healthcare experiences compassion. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few details about what you can expect. Please note that the program will last 60 minutes with a panel discussion for the first 40 minutes or so, followed by some time for questions. Feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A pane throughout the discussion. I'd also like to acknowledge with gratitude that this Compassion in Action webinar series has been funded in part by a generous donation made in memory of Julian and Eunice Cohen. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Beth Lown, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief Medical Officer of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. And I know she's excited to get this conversation started. Thank you, Julie, very, very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And today we will be joined by Dr. Ken Epstein. Ken works as a consultant, helping individuals, couples, families, communities, and organizations repair, heal, and promote collaborative culture change. He has practiced, taught, and supervised for close to three decades. And he's going to review the context of organizational culture, the importance of reflective practice, and the necessity of measuring our capacity to be a healing organization for the people who work in it, as well as for the communities we serve. Um, so welcome, Ken. I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you so much. Give me a second to share my screen. OK. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Beth and Julie and the Schwartz Center for having me. Um, I just want to um, reintroduce myself um, for a moment and um, also frame this talk and, uh, and then go on. But I want to start with um, this. This talk is going to be about connection and relationship. And uh, as you can imagine, that's challenging as we um, do these kinds of hybrid and Zoom experiences. So I want to let you know a little bit more about me. Um, I'm, I'm white. Uh, I'm Jewish. Um, I'll be 66 soon. And um, I'm a social worker. I'm the middle generation of three generations of social work. Um, my poor brother, he's a physician. I don't know why he didn't follow the path, but um, he was older, so he didn't know as well. Um, but um, I, um, I've been working in the field of children, youth, and families since my 20s. Uh, I uh, have seen lots of change. And I've seen um, lots of challenge. And today's presentation is really uh, sort of a compendium of um, looking at a systemic view of how trauma impacts organizations and how we can think about healing as a larger context from the healing many of you all do directly with patients to how do we think about and practice and organize ourselves into organizational healing and healing organizations. <clears throat> I do wanna start um, with context, um, an acknowledgement of um, the lands that I and we live on and have lived on uh, for the time memorial that these were and are tribal lands and pay respects to our elders, their elders past and present. Um, and to also recognize that um, this country today was built not only on often stolen land or stolen land and um, stolen labor and that these, um, this legacy is embedded and embodied in our, uh, our culture, our history, and our organizations. And I can't talk about how we can think about organizational health without talking about the ways in which this is embedded and embodied into our persons and our organizations. I also have to say that um, the theme of land and labor um, is not one that just this country deals with, but it's one throughout the world that we um, 
the impacts of generational trauma um, are impacting Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel as we as we sit here and talk. And this theme of intergenerational trauma impacting the ways in which we relate to each other is part of and underlying this talk, as well as the resilience that we all have in our DNA and in our communities and in our histories. I wanted to start with some principles and tell a bit of a story. I, 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 I took a job in the Department of Public Health in San Francisco in 2012. Um, I had never worked for a county before I'd worked in nonprofits and in university systems. And I was in my 50s and my the director of public health, whose name was is Barbara Garcia, um, um, was a mentor of mine and asked me um, why I would take this job uh, in my 50s, first time entering into the county land. The job I took was the director of children, youth and families for the city and county of San Francisco, which was in charge of the behavioral health system for children up to the age of 21 and young adults. So she asked me this question, like, why would I take this job? Which is sort of a scary question to ask two weeks into the into your new job. And I answered like this, and this is sort of how I wanna start by framing this conversation. That in my career starting in Massachusetts in the, in the late seventies, uh, we, we were involved in um, politically trying to liberate young people and adults from uh, from psychiatric hospitals, um, literally in the liberation, the mental patient, as it was called, liberation movement, uh, we were plucking folks out of the state hospitals and putting them in what we thought were more humane and compassionate settings, which were group homes and community mental health. I, I say that as a frame for, in my world, treatment and evidence has come a long, long way since I started in the field. And, we all should be proud in our separate fields in medicine or health and healthcare about how far we have come in terms of evidence and treatments and abilities to help individuals, communities, families. Um, and at the same time, I said to Barbara Garcia, over this time, the data and around the realities for black and brown children in San Francisco and the differences in their outcomes and health outcomes with white children and youth in San Francisco had gotten worse. The divide had gotten greater. And how is it that we could understand or um, internalize, metabolize the, the thought that we had so much better evidence and much more treatment and in fact, a better funded system than I had ever seen before, and yet, and yet, the uh, the results um, in terms of healthcare outcomes were worse, not better. And I had an idea about that. That um, I didn't have a whole idea, but I had an idea about that. That um, that it had to do with thinking about how our systems were structured, and that our systems actually had become uh, traumatized, and that you could see the symptoms of are, um, you could see the symptoms that we attribute to um, individuals and communities and families in our systems. And she said, well, you should just train the whole department. And there were 9,000 people. And um, I wished I had never had that conversation. But at that point, we began an effort in the Department of Public Health to build a training program, which we then termed trauma-informed systems and develop these principles. I'm not showing you these principles as if they need to be your principles. I'm showing you to show you that these were the underlying principles that we argued about every word because we're in San Francisco um, for, for lots and lots of time until we came up with this and then changed them four times over time. But if you look at these principles, they're really the structure of relationship. And during this talk, um, you can't talk about compassionate care without talking about relationship. I also want to say as I enter into this talk that everything I've told you so far is the world according to my lived experience, my bias, my privilege, how I've worked in the world. And I hope that you um, 
you know, you listen to this and then translate it through your own experiences and your places and your principles. But it's based in the idea that basically we we can't we can't look at suffering daily, either ours or our patients or our community. It's just not realistic to be able to um, to be able to do that. And an example of that is we appropriately celebrated healthcare workers with applause during the COVID lockdown. Um, but we also um, didn't fully um, recognize or acknowledge the grief that many of you, um, the loss that many of you, that all of us experienced at that time as we're clapping and applauding, we're often not recognizing uh, the simultaneous grief and sadness and despair that these incidents and episodes create for us. And so, it creates a, an environment where um, we begin thinking about these symptoms that you all um, you all know about and have experienced in the healthcare field that were happening before the COVID lockdown. That the healthcare field is really uh, experiencing existential crisis: retirements, burnout, um, nurses leaving the field, uh, increased symptomatology among workers around health, you know, their own health and wellness vicarious trauma, burnout, and compassion fatigue. And we've gotten into this sort of dialectic about, uh, you know, whose fault is it uh, in this either or world? And I love that, um, you know, that Wendy Dean and, and colleagues, and I know you're all familiar with this in terms of defining a lot of what's happening to us as um, a more nuanced way of thinking about it is that, that people are experiencing moral injury. Uh, really that process of experiencing um, something that we know will help our patients and our healthcare, but we're unable to provide it. And worse off that it's beyond our control. So we feel we're in environments that um, we know what to do. We know what we want to do. We got into the field to do it. And the constraints are so large that it actually creates a symptomatology among us and our workforce. And if you begin to see it as moral injury, you begin to actually see it as a systemic issue, as opposed to one in which is individually based. And often people feel blamed. You must be burned out. You must be experiencing this. You need treatment. Let's send you out for this, as opposed to seeing what's happening inside. Another way of thinking about it is, um, you know, if if there are a bunch of people that are in the river and we're pulling people out of the river, um, we need to look upstream and figure out how they got in the river. And that's really what this talk is centering about. Uh, what you begin to see then is this parallel process where, um, where staff um, begin to feel more and more unsafe and angry and helpless, that our clients feel these symptoms, and the organization has the same set of symptoms. And it becomes sort of a collective disturbance. So that's sort of the outline of, of sort of what we're gonna talk about. And I wanna get more specific about um, this idea about organizational trauma. You can see this, this, um, this cartoon says, anybody have any bold initiatives they'd like to unleash? Now, I don't know about you, you're from all over the country. There's 214 of you and maybe the world, I don't know where you're all located. But here in San Francisco, we're like a city of initiatives on steroids. Um, we keep solving the same problem with a new set of initiatives, racial equity, trauma-informed staff, wellness, quality improvement, resources, culture change, lean. We keep bringing more and more initiatives. And the larger the organization, the more initiatives there are. And these initiatives are often, often fragmented from each other and often poorly resourced with all the idea that they're gonna shift the culture of an organization, but they're in different committees and different places and different spaces. And uh, I think you begin to see, or as we began to see in the Department of Public Health or certainly see in San Francisco is this sense of initiative fatigue. Oh, here we go again, solving the same problem with a new set of initials, a new set of words, a new set of uh, priorities. And yet, and yet, and yet these are long-term issues. So I wanna give you an, un, an overview of, um, of sort of organizational, um, the way this impacts organizations. And I wanna use my hand, but this is my metaphorical hand on the screen so to, to tell you 
how this hurts. The first thing that hurts is trauma. Now, many of us understand trauma as an individual event or events that impact that person over time that creates functional, um, functional problems in their ability to, to function in the world. Um, certainly the psychiatric di diagnosis of PTSD would give us a sense of, oh, trauma is, um, is something that's embedded and embodied in an individual. Um, I'm gonna use a much larger um, um, definition of trauma that sees trauma not only as of embedded in individuals, but in families and communities and can be transmitted intergenerationally. And yes, it can be embedded into organizations and it includes intergenerational trauma, racial trauma, and all of the kinds of things that happen in our culture that create, um, create the ability to function. And in organizations, you can see the impact of trauma that hurts by the us versus them, the numbing that happens to people, the way in which people need to leave or the way in which somebody might introduce myself as soon as I start in the Department of Public Health and they may say, Hi, I'm Bob, I'm retiring in five years. You begin to see, and then what am I supposed to be doing with Bob for the next five years? You begin to see the way in which um, the organizational structure and the, the ways in which the reactivity is built into the organization become part of the organizational culture. The second thing that hurts is inequality. Um, now we know that in, inequality is something that we try to address through policies and procedures, but it's embedded in our day-to-day -day interactions. It's embedded in our processes, our procedures. Often we're, we have good policies, quote unquote, but our actions don't reflect our policies. And so inequity is built into our structure and you begin to see disciplinary differences, hiring differences, promotional differences, and the inequality of even who the service providers are in communities that, that would, would benefit from service providers that more reflect their experiences and lived experiences. So inequity and inequality hurts. Now my middle finger for metrics, it's just a coincidence that um, it's my middle finger, I promise you, um, but it's M and M. And metrics hurt because metrics are a hammer. People experience metrics as coming from the top down and, and, and have a, a feel of having to meet those metrics on demand. And there's a, a sense of the way in which they are um, compliance organize, organized, risk organized, and not always meaningful to the staff in which the metrics are being applied. And reactivity. Um, reactivity hurts because we work in environments where we're constantly moving, constantly feeling like there's there's something new, constantly reacting to new dilemmas and constantly making decisions that don't have time for reflection. And that hurts when we go into work every day feeling like we're going to enter into a reactive environment. And this is different than potentially you being in a, a, a you know emergency room surgeon which obviously is a reactive place. I'm talking about the culture around that, the way in which people interact with each other feels more reactive than reflective. And productivity hurts. Um, we take a lot of words from a field that is not ours. Um, productivity, efficiency, deliverables, these come from the field of for-profits and the, and, the and the private sector. And we translate these and, and we tell people they need to be productive and it hurts because it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with why we got into the field and what we're doing. So it hurts when we talk about productivity. But the hand that heals is if we're gonna believe that trauma is embedded and embodied in our organizations and we need to do work to build compassionate and relational care, it's gonna take time. And I'm telling you all, all 220 of you now, that there is no time. You are now, and maybe it's even gotten worse. You're going from Zoom to Zoom, from lunch to lunch, uh, without lunch, from meeting to meeting, to person to person, without a break. And the meet, you know, and there's a sense that there isn't time. And if anything, you wanted to establish a system that wasn't going to change, you would take time away because change is dependent on time. 
And that's the hand that heals. Inclusion. Um, if inequity hurts, feeling included in the mission and the and what we're doing heals. And inclusion is not just an inclusive policy. It's the feeling of being that you're involved in meetings, that you understand where decisions are made, that decision-making is clear, authentic, transparent, that you feel like the mission of the organization matches your, your healing objectives. And that begins to heal. And meaning, if metrics are a hammer, then meaning is actually the, 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 the substance of what we need because you can have data. I love data. Everybody, I love data. Data is really important, but data is only as important as we can make meaning of it. And data is not just about what one person says it is and then we need to do. Data is about something that I can internalize, make, make meaning of, and that heals. And reflection, uh, reflection in react in reaction in reactive environments. Reflection is the antidote. Having space to think, to talk, to feel what's going on begins to heal. And finally, practice. Whereas productivity is that space where we feel like we're being pushed to a certain place. Practice is a place that heals. And by the way, for those of you that are not practitioners and you're the fiscal people, you're saying, well, I got a bill. You can bill for practice. You can bill for engagement. I can ask somebody what's happening about their engagement and how their engagement is not happening at the level it needs to happen. But language is important. What we do is we practice in the field. So that's the overview of what, what, what I see in the world, according to Ken, becomes um, part and parcel with how organizations can be, bureaucracies can become heartful. And understanding that is that bureaucracies left alone harm. Bureaucracies left alone harm. Not necessarily people, it is not people's intention to harm mostly, but bureaucracies left alone kill curiosity. Bureaucracies left alone become compliance centered and risk organized as opposed to not, not needing that you can't do that, but as opposed to intentional, longitudinal, resourced and aligned and restorative. So the question is, how do you then operate in a tilted house? Um, and I think it starts with intentional systemic practices. First off, from my perspective, seeing the problem systemically, not as embedded in the particular leader du jour or the staff that are there now or the way it is, or it's out of my control, but intentional systemic practices can take place at all levels of the organization. And that's how we begin to stand up straight in a tilted house. And it starts with thinking about the, rec the hands of change and to you know, review the two hands it's about rec it's not about one or the other. It's not about just the healing hand or the recognition hand, but you can't heal what you don't recognize. So you can't restore what you don't recognize. So where there's trauma, we need to then fight for time. And when there's inequity, we need to fight for inclusion. And where there's a need for metrics, we need to fight for spaces to make meaning out of those, those metrics. And where there's a reactive organization, we need to create re reflective spaces. And where, of course, we're probably not going to change the reality that the funders need us to be productive and our fiscal basis is about productivity, we could begin to make meaning out of it by thinking about the quality of that and the practice that we're involved in, not just the productivity. So let's start with recognition. Um, the the, the trauma-informed folks like to, like to think that we're moving from what's wrong with a person or a system to what's happening or has happened to ourselves, clinic, organization, or colleagues. And then what gets us through? There is a um, obscure um, Jewish text um, from 2000 years ago that's been sort of um, becoming popularized by many uh, rabbis and and scholars given what's going on today in the world. And the text goes that um, um, the, uh, the, the, the Israelites, the Jewish folks would go up to the Temple Mount and they would circle the Temple Mount clockwise um, as a ritual 
to honor that space. Um, and um, yet those folks that were having heartbreak or heart or had lost somebody or were lonely or sick would walk counterclockwise. And as the story goes, the folks walking clockwise would be obliged to ask, what's, what's, the, what's underneath your heartache? What's happening for you? What has happened? What happens when we were all walking clockwise in the system as it is now, begin to pause and see and recognize those that are walking counterclockwise, so many of us that are hurt and harmed and in pain. Because one of the great crimes of tribalism is the lack of curiosity. And curiosity is the key to sustainable change. So I'm gonna just go through um, in the next 15 minutes, um, all too fast, just some of the qualities of what we might be promoting in, a, in, a, in an organization that's a healing organization. And it starts with curiosity. And I see that as the mirror and the landscape. The mirror is how we look at ourselves. I mean, I gave you a very small mirror of myself when I opened up and told you more about who I am and, and, um, and how I might be seen racially or my religion uh, or you know, even my, my profession. Um, I have many, many selves, much more than that, that I might bring to the work. And if I don't look in the mirror and understand those selves, I will over and over again um, create mistakes and have. And the landscape is the context of where we're in. So questions are, you know, questions are, I don't know how I made those clouds move. Okay. Anyway, questions are our superpower. And, um, you know, there are three, in reflective practice, we like to think that there are three ways of asking questions. And often we reflect on action. So we review what happened in the past and we try to debrief it and, and fix it, all very important. We spend a lot of time in our meetings doing that. There's another kind of set of questions and curiosity that takes much more courage, which is how do we reflect in action? Um, right in the present, when something's happened, can we, in our organization, have the, the ability to ask questions, to stop a process, to address um, with love and care a microaggression, to address an ouch, to think about how we're moving forward in the present, and, and is that a culture that's present in our organization? And then reflection, reflection for action is thinking about how everything we do will focus on something in the future so that we begin to build change. So Ken Hardy likes to think about this process in three ways. Uh, he, he talks about seeing, which is engaging in a process of, of our own vision. Really, who am I and how am I benefiting from the belief or position I have? So when you have a reaction to something or I have a reaction to something in a meeting, how is, how is my belief impacting that and my patterns? And am I pre-existing patterns perpetuating something? And then being is really looking at our beliefs and our emotions. Um, it often comes from our origin stories, um, how we grew up, where we grew up, what were the, what, what were the ideas and, and, and beliefs that we grew up. And then doing is the process of, of, of you know, really taking the seeing and being and then trying not to shoot without aiming. And this idea of looking in the mirror as to who I am um, begins to then address how I can, I can then do something with that in mind. And Alicia Lieberman, a trauma um, expert, worldwide trauma expert, uh, coined the term triads as a way of understanding how we can look at the landscape. Um, and so it starts with adversity. The first part of the triad starts with adversity. Uh, and adversity is different than trauma and adversity is different than stress. Adversity is part of our human experience. And we have begun to pathologize adversity. Um, needless to say, while many people are, um, are doing, if you're familiar with the ACEs screen, for example, the um, adverse childhood experiences, without stating an opinion as to whether that screen is, um, 
important or not, because there's a division about it, what it's doing is it's screening about adversity. And all it's telling us is that a person has or has experienced a level of adversity. It does not tell us that there's a pathology related to that. And you can think about the same thing with our organizations. Our organizations can be under extraordinary adversity. And that could be normal because of what we do. It is not a diagnosis, it's a human experience. The way we can think about the, the level of adversity is by distress. We can ask ourselves, oh, this person has had, or this, this doctor has had, or this healthcare system has had, or this community has had, adversity, how do we understand the level of distress that the that they're experiencing? And that's a way of understanding, okay, once there's a lot of distress, we can begin to see the symptomatology. But that's only the second part of the triad. The third is strengths, because the real, um, the real healing power is from understanding the capacity for strengths. So there can be extraordinary adversity, extraordinary distress, and an incredible system of strengths and resilience and community to support. And therefore um, we have that. So we, we look at the way of like looking at or diagnosing organizational health as thinking about the landscape is looking at these three, three lenses in triads. But it's important to understand how stress affects our job performance. Um, the Yerkes Dutch in law says that, you know, if we have no, stress, then we're asleep. And if we have extraordinary stress, then we're disorganized. So this is not a talk about your jobs, our jobs being stress-free. Um, we do not have stress-free jobs. We're not talking about that capacity. We'd be asleep. And some organizations I've worked with are pretty sleepy and some are disorganized. So what we're looking for is, is this, this modicum of optimal, um, really optimal stress so that we can focus, there's a certain amount of stress that's optimal, so that allows us to really do our jobs better, op operate better as an organization, and it increases performance. So focusing on, on this element and understanding how stress is affecting our job performance is, is necessary. And then just a little bit of an exercise. I'm going to breathe and give you a little bit of exercise um, uh, for the mirror landscape. If you have a piece of paper or you just want to do it on your phone or in your head, I want, I want you to ask yourself these three questions. And this, these four R's come from the, the after the pan, after the, the, the um, shutdown and the, after the pandemic, um, we were asked in San Francisco to um, to start Heal SF to respond to first responders. And as many of you knew, and I learned, there's a, you know, there's a pandemic response which starts with readiness and response and recovery. And we brought renewal in, um, which comes from school violence work um, and is focused on those things that we're learning. And as we began to, as the pandemic was no longer three months and no longer three years, um, we began to understand that this was more of a psychological understanding as well. Um, we began to realize that um, as we moved on, people where everybody started off maybe in the readiness and response version, um, we began to become much more spread out in our organizations about where we were and are in response to not only the pandemic, but the, the, the entire um, perspective of what's happening in our country, uh, the racial reckoning after George Floyd's um, murder, uh, increased hate, Asian hate, now thinking about anti-Semitism and uh, increases in, in Islamophobia, uh, transphobia, the increase in the political dialogue becoming us versus them, all of this, and if you're in California, the experience of fires and in other places, other climate disasters that have happened, all of this has escalated this feeling of being in response. And the question I wanna ask yourself to use this mirror and landscape is what phase are you in? What phase are your supervis supervisees or teammates in? And what phase is the organization in? I'm just gonna pause for a second for you to think about that and sort of maybe write where you are and see if they're aligned or not.
Okay, and maybe later in question and answer or chat, you can, if somebody wants to tell me what, what happened around this, I'm happy to hear that. So that's recognition. Um, recognition is that part of we can't repair what we don't recognize, we can't restore what we don't recognize, and we keep fixing things that we don't recognize. When I showed this um, this to a, a healthcare system, oh, you know, about a year ago, there was a person in the meeting. It was a CEO, C, a C-suite in an organization, and there was a person in the room who I didn't know if they were going to take this in or they were ready for it or they thought it was important and. After I asked these three questions and showed them the slide, um, this, this man raised his hand and he said, um, wow, I just realized that I, I'm in recovery. You know, I'm doing well, I got all these ideas, we're running initiatives, we're moving forward, but my staff is in response. And it helped me understand why there's a mismatch between the way in which I'm leading and the way in which they're following. Uh, and so, uh, I just invite you to think about um, the alignment uh, between who you are and how you are operating and how your staff is operating and or your colleagues and or your organization. So let's talk for a few minutes about restoration or repair um, and the process of disrupting the cycle of reactivity. And again, the overlapping here is that it's not like we're not going to be reactive. We live in reactive spaces. The question is, how do we build reflective spaces in reactive places? I've talked about the, the impact of the cycle of reactivity, that you have instability, no felt safety, there are indignities, um, there's a lack of in integrity and trustworthiness, and that the healing pathway has this idea of recognizing and restore, restoring towards healing. And that includes stability and reflection and dignity and institutional responsibility and trust. So as we think about where do we start um, when we, you know, if you're starting this work, the foundation of starting, uh, from my perspective, is starting with safety and stability. When I talk about safety, I'm not talking about discomfort. We're in we're in jobs and conversations that were often uncomfortable. Um, but the questions I would ask you to think about is. What's the culture of your organization and safety? Um, mistake surveillance versus mistake making, mistake discipline versus mistake meaning, mistake anxious versus mistake learning. And I understand that there are places for, you know, surgeons or physicians where there are life and death situations where mistakes, you don't have this sort of um, opportunity. The question I'm asking is culturally in your organization around the ways in which communication takes place, the ways in which you feel in your organization, the ways in which you're trying to lead your organizations. How do you how do you feel and how does your employees feel about this idea of having more of a surveillance, discipline, and anxious environment versus a meaning-making and learning environment? And if it starts with um, if it starts with safety. Um, I like to think about the three C's that we center relational practices. Um, and the three C's are connection, coherence, and collaboration. Um, now, if you, if you wanna understand what happens to all of us when we experience trauma or just stress or very big stress, is that often when we're not doing well, we get disconnected. Um, things feel chaotic or we feel alone. And so if those are symptoms that you begin to see in organizations where our staff are isolated more often, are feeling more chaotic, um, or feeling like things don't make sense, uh, are in meetings that don't make sense to them, um, don't feel meaningly, meaningfully connected to their colleagues and their staff and their leaders, uh, you begin to see this level of dis dis disengagement, which I would say is the process of moral, uh, moral injury. And so centering these three processes um, is part of the healing process. And here's some examples of that. Um, I don't use the word, how are you anymore? Um, because when you're asking somebody, how are you? You get sort of a pat answer. So um, one of the things that I've, um, I've, I've sort of focused on is how are you holding up? Now, my colleague, Alicia Lieberman says, um, 
that you, you don't need to be a therapist to be therapeutic. So if you're reading this and thinking, oh, Ken, you're a social worker and you do therapy and I'm in a different position, uh, I'm saying that these things can happen very, very quickly and can be embedded and embodied in what you do. They can be embedded in you know, check-ins at meetings that can take three to five minutes. They can be done on chat or in person. They can be done in dyads. They can be done through mindfulness exercises. Having brief structured check-ins with colleagues and individuals, just, just to say, how are you holding up? And establishing rituals, gratitude huddles and celebrations. Um, and then coherence um, is really trying to combat that sense of chaos. And like a question around that is what's on your mind? Now, I might be coming in with something on my mind that has nothing to do with work, um, but, but I'm trying to sit in a meeting and I can't concentrate. So a check-in around what's on somebody's mind allows them potentially to be more available, um, allows us to say that I got it, repeating it, and allows them to sit in the room and be a bit more regulated. Um, I don't know about your experiences, but I know from my experiences that when we start meetings with things like, all right, here's the agenda. By the way, there's a budget cut. Um, by the way, there's this. And people are already coming in potentially um, dysregulated in some way. Either they check out, they, they fire up, or they leave. You know, I think what, what we're talking about, the therapeutic part, is as a leader or a participant is beginning to think about how do you create more coherence and in, in, in the meeting? And then collaboration is who helps you stay on track? So then promoting intentionality. Um, this is sort of a model of how do we think about organizational change in intentional ways? Um, it, it takes all of these things, not one of these things, and it's really focused on champions and catalysts. I will tell you this is a you know this is a longer presentation than this is capable of, but there is there no revolution, no change has been completely started by a CEO or a leader. Um, for those of you that are champions or catalysts or embedded in organizations, um, change happens from the bottom up, the middle in, and hopefully with leadership engagement. It requires training, but training is not not is important but not sufficient. Um, having a common set of principles, um, the train and pray method, such as I'm doing today, is not a change agent unless there's engagement, there's people embedded as trainers, um, champions, that we have policy and practice and evaluation. And this is what we did in the Department of Public Health. We built an implementation science uh, model of trying to build change. And today, 13 years, uh, 11 years later, there's still a trauma-informed systems organization within the department. So focusing on knowledge and values, um, commitment to change, how do we change our individual practices and our organizational practices are part of this formula of implementation practice. I like this quote from Fixon, the use of effective interventions without inter implementation strategies is like a serum without a syringe. The cure is available, but the delivery system is not. Ensure alignment. I spoke about this before. Um, we, we, we have initiatives on, on, on steroids and they work in opposite places. We have champions doing, we have all of this good stuff happening, but they're not often aligned. Um, there is no trauma-informed systems without racial justice, racial equity. Um, and, you know, basically, if we're doing racial equity and justice work, I would argue we are doing trauma informed work and we are doing quality improvement. So linking these and not competing resources is critical to organizational change. And then measuring and celebrating organizational health. I imagine that many of you have culture surveys um, and um, I know in my organization, they would give culture surveys over and over again. Maybe they'd even switch the, the organization that did the culture survey. We'd have lower and lower amounts of folks um, even participating in it because there was not a sense that people responded to the culture kinds of things that were happening. Um, so I encourage you to measure um, the relational and connected components of your organization 
And Bloom and Fargo said, a resilient organization is able to adopt and adapt and thrive in times of uncertainty, pressure, and ambiguity. So one of the things, for example, we, in one of our culture surveys, one of our directors recognized that her staff were not feeling respected. And she spent 18 months using a lean uh, quality improvement technology to um, improve respect among her staff. And over 18 months, she improved that by 27% by just swarming around that idea of what respect meant and what they meant by not feeling respected. And the staff said that what made it better for them, what actually made that happen is that a leader acknowledged what they were saying and began to measure its change, that that was important to them. So in summary, uh, what I've talked about is this idea of moving from a trauma-inducing to a trauma-reducing system. Uh, the trauma-organized system are the symptoms that I told you of reactive, reliving, retelling, avoiding, numbing, inequity. Um, trauma-informed is that sense of training, having a common sense of understanding, recognizing sociocultural, so structural oppression, the nature and impact of trauma and trauma recovery. It's, it's a common language. We all need that, but it's not sufficient. What's trauma reducing is really beginning to measure an organization's capacity to be reflective, to make meaning out of the past, relational leadership, and whatever you would put into the relational compassionate part of an organization and giving it as much power in measurement as you measure your transactional components. Because we're not saying that organization should not be transactional, I am saying that we have to build the muscle around relational practices, measure them with the same rigor and enthusiasm and, or, and overarching and time commitment to measuring the healing parts of our organizations so that we can begin to use our have our transactional and our relational components of our organization help us get, guide us towards our ultimate goal, which is to be a healing organization healing our community and healing our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, that was terrific. And it's, it's inspiring and it gives direction. Um, I'm going to go to some of the questions and uh, thoughts in the chat and the, the Q and A and um, just saying, it's very, very interesting to see when you asked about where you and the and the uh, R's, you know, um, people have varying, varying responses. And one person, Julie, uh, has asked, thank you for the opportunity. And if you're in a large organization with many sites, is it possible to be in different phases depending on the location? So the question is, is it possible to be in different different I phases think, of the um, the response, recovery, renewal, you know? I would say it's not only possible in different organizations, I think it's possible in different teams. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think it's clear in large organizations that different parts of the organization are in different places. I know that that was certainly clear in the Department of Public Health, which was 9,000 people. Mm. Uh, so I couldn't imagine that all of the departments were in the same place. That would be impossible. But the question also is within the same team, mm -hmm. the same leadership. Mm -hmm. And are you working to, if you, you're looking at that, are you working within your team and you're a part of the organization to build more alignment? Yeah. And then you try to build more alignment organizationally. So the answer is, of course. Yeah, and, and to that end, um, Christine uh, Devon uh, built on that asking whether it's possible to be a misalignment between um, where you would consider yourself to be personally as opposed to professionally. It's an interesting question. Can you say that again? So wondering if there can be lack of agreement alignment between where one would consider themselves to be personally in the four R's versus professionally. For sure. And I think, may, I mean, I don't know, I'm not, I mean, I think the question is the answer, you know, sometimes the question I think probably comes from a person's own experience. Mm -hmm. So I would say our experience is our experience. We we may have a very, um, we may be in recovery in our, um, our home life or not, or more in reactive, you know, in, in a more um, 
response mode in our home life and being more in recovery, I'm sure. And that, and the important thing about that is it impacts how we function. For sure. Um, there are a lot of thank yous <laughs> in, in the, in the chat. Um, and um, one expression of real suffering in the chat, I just want to note that, um, you know, the, the comments made by one of our participants. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, another Carrie saying, I, I'd say I'm in renewal, but, uh, you know, many of the people I work with are in response and I'm trying hard to tap into remembering what being, uh, you know, response reactive look like so I can respond and show up with empathy and compassion, um, which I think is a is a interesting comment and it sort of speaks to the work we have to do. I mean, to what extent do you mention this sort of cycle, Ken, in order to help people think about how how can this disjunction between where we're at, not just within ourselves, you know, but within teams, within organizations, how can we use this sort of lack of um, alignment or, you know, lack of being all in the same place? How can we use that to learn? I was thinking of a metaphor. I'm going to answer the question as best I can, because it also relates to some of the other questions. Um, Barbara Garcia gave me a metaphor. She was my the person I mentioned, DPH, about how she understood organizational change. And she saw organizations as big, lumbering, huge freighters on the on the ocean. Mm -hmm. That um, what what we needed to do and with a bunch of tugboats trying to move it. And that often organizations, those tugboats are moving in different directions. And so the, the, the freighter is staying the same in homeostasis. And um, her analysis is that the place for everybody along the line is to try to be a tugboat moving in the same direction as another one. And that my answer to that question is, for those of you that, you know, I, the person that's working in a very toxic place that has compromised their mental health, I mean, I would say, you know, probably it's, it's if it's possible to think about whether, you know, another option is possible or how to protect and take care of yourself. Um, that That's an alignment with a healing organization. Sometimes we have to make decisions if we're able to make those decisions to move in a different direction. I would also say that the whole focus on self-care, um, which is underlying some of this, uh, it, it's also important but I don't know about other people on this call, but when after the COVID lockdown, I was getting like, you know, emails from Hertz saying I need to take care of myself, um, you know, do self-care. Like everybody, I mean, I was getting emails from everybody under the sun who I'd ever done to take. And I think what wasn't talked about is the importance of organizational care. And mm -hmm. I think what I'm talking about today is the construction of an idea of organizational care, which both communicates that the organization is trying to take care of the health and well-being of the people that work in it and provides resources and capacity to do that. And um, that that is the application of the four R's. It's like, so we're in different places. It may not be so, but the recognition of this is critical. As critical, healing comes through recognition. We can't keep fixing the same thing over again, and then it breaks. So I think I'm answering the question as best as I can and looking at some other comments. Yeah, I think I, I just wanna, you know, also in our Healing Healthcare Initiative, in fact, um, you know, a great insight from one of the leaders was the recognition that they are actually in a different place in the four R's. You mm -hmm. know, they were further along that cycle mm -hmm. And that's why they were sort of not being trusted, not feeling this, the healthcare workforce was not feeling heard, listened to, or responded to because they were really out of sync. And so that actually, that recognition of the lack of alignment of disjunction actually was a, a, a really uh, pointed learning place for them. Um, so I think that's, you know, in part how it's help, helpful. Um, I want to add one more thing that I, yeah. I know. I mean, I started off with this and I, I know when people are thinking about change, I, I can't not say that as a man, as a white man in an organization, I might have capacities that other, you know, privilege that other people may not have in their organizations to push back or align. Um, and so that's where the context and our lived experience is important. And that's where um, 
I feel like aligning um, the racial equity and racial justice um, is central to this work. Mm -hmm. um, because we can make lots of culture change in our organizations without addressing a foundational issue about the ways in which um, people's entrance into the organization and their experience is different. Yeah, and these are all interdependent, interactive interdependencies, you know, uh, all affect each other. Um, there's a, a question here in the in the Q and A about focusing only on positives or bests, like the appreciative inquiry approach, you know, as the main way to connect, starting meetings with what's going well versus, I suppose, other approaches to healing. I think these are personal choices. I see that question from Karen. So I think, Karen, these are personal choices. So my personal, so I'm going to just say personally, this is not like, this is the world according to Ken. This is not fact. Um, that I think if we don't focus on people's um, distress at some point, we don't recognize the distress at some point. Now, does that mean where we start is more positive and we recognize distress somewhere else? But that's where reflective practice comes in, is building reflective moments where people can talk about what's going on for them. Because if we don't talk about what's going on for them, us, you all know, it just metabolizes into our body, into our organizations, and into mm -hmm. our health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Karen, I don't know, know what to say. When I do check-ins, by the way, check-ins have to be short. So they do you know, I might ask like, what gives you joy? Or I might do a mindfulness thing, or I might say something like, you know, is there a poem, a book, a movie title, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a streaming show, uh, you know, that with a title that um, would describe how you're coming to the room today. Or I might say something like, if you're, how you're coming into the screen today was a weather report, what would the weather report be? So sometimes I might, start differently when I do this, just because um, some people may not respond to the it being all positive, I guess. Yeah, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So a balanced acknowledgement of, of both. There's an important question for an individual from Jan in the uh, chat from an individual in a system that's on the disconnected, chaotic side. Do you have a recommended first step? And I assume that she's talking about the organization rather than the, yeah, in a system that is on that sort mm -hmm. of disconnected, chaotic side. Mm -hmm. Well, Janet, obviously, in the, it, it's hard to um, it's hard to know where to start, but I think it always starts with another person. So I think like if I was in an organization that there was nothing happening, and I had no leadership engagement, and it was on the disorganized, chaotic side. I'd find another person and then I might find some one person with a little bit more influence than me. And I would start the conversation about whether we can think about a systemic approach to addressing it. Um, this is a, you know, this is a journey, not a sprint. And so, again, without knowing more, I mean, I was lucky. I had a boss that I told this story to and she said, go for it. But I will tell you, she didn't tell any of her she didn't tell any of the people that reported to her that she gave somebody four four layers from her to do this. So we still needed to build like a little, you know, we, we told ourselves rebels with a cause, you know? So, you know, I, I have that side of me that says, you know, try and find some colleagues that are like, and then have a reading group or a study group or a conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Champions and catalysts, you said, Ken. Too. Champions and catalysts. Yeah, right. yeah, love that. Um, there's some really great, great questions, but I, I wanted to point to this. Uh, can you please elaborate on the link you see between trauma-informed systems and quality improvement? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I'm not a, I think quality improvement is thinking about improving the culture of what we do in an organization. And I think it actually needs to be linked. I could talk for a whole lot. I was in an organization that centered lean. So I don't know how many people on the screen are familiar with it, but I made an, an effort to understand lean. And I mean, the, I'm just gonna say this, frankly, I found lean to be um, uh, organizational change without a heart often. And I think the link is that trauma-informed systems and relational care can bring a bit more of a heart to a really good technology around change. I really liked the lean technology 
And let's remember it came from Toyota. A lot of our quality improvement mechanisms came again from the, from the for-profit sector. What we're experts on is healing. And all I'm trying to all I'm trying to emphasize is like let's not loosen the power of the language of healing by adopting just practices that come from a sector that makes widgets or cars. It's not that we can't do it, but let's balance it and learn from each other and not compromise the, the incredible evidence. Our best evidence is about healing. And we know that there is no better evidence for healing than relationships. I mean, it's it's the best evidence we have. Well, I am so sorry. I, Julie has popped back on and that that is signaling us that we must bring an end to the webinar. This is recorded and we will have it available on our website uh, shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. Not the same day, but keep looking and go onto our archived websites and you will find it there. Julie, I'll turn this back over to you to close us out. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ken. That was a, a really wonderful conversation. And thank you to all of you who joined us here today. We hope you enjoyed this Compaction in Action webinar. Please keep an eye on your email for news of future events. And finally, please take a moment to fill out the very brief survey we'll be sending you after this webinar. We appreciate your feedback on today's session. Thank you for joining us and for your commitment to compassionate healthcare. Take care, and we hope to see you soon.